Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the way that you speak to us through your word. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the promises that you make to us through your Son. Father, as we study your word, we pray that you would enlighten us. We pray that you would teach us. And Father, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, we would be transformed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Daniel chapter 9 is where we're at. Just to kind of give you a little bit of recap where we've been so far. Uh, Daniel 9 begins in verse 1, in the first year of Darius, uh, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolations of Jerusalem would last 70 years. And this, so, so this kind of sets up Daniel chapter 9. And as Daniel 9 opens, we are in the first year of Darius. And that is the year 539 B.C. Now, here's the deal, okay? Uh, Daniel and his comrades ha had gone into exile because Jerusalem was destroyed uh, quite a few years earlier in the year 605 B.C. And Daniel understands when he's reading Jeremiah the prophet that uh, the desolation of Jerusalem was to last 70 years. And so here's the deal. Uh, we are now getting close to that 70-year mark since Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed by the Babylonians. And uh, Daniel is beginning to get, um, let's just say, a little bit anxious. He's beginning to get ready uh, for God to come through on his promise that uh, the desolation of Jerusalem is not going to last forever. We're getting real close to that point where maybe the Israelites are going to be able to return to their homes. And actually they do because in the year 538 B.C., uh, Cyrus uh, issues or Darius issues a decree that the Jews are able to return to their homes. And uh, one of the things that they do is they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. If you haven't read those stories, Ezra and Nehemiah. Those two books in the Old Testament are all about the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple therein. And so Daniel's beginning to get a little bit anxious. He's beginning to get a little bit excited. And so what does he do with his anxiousness and excitement, knowing that the 70 years is almost up, knowing the Jews are going to be able to return to their home pretty soon? Here's what he does. He prays, which is, which is pretty good, don't you think? When you're anxious, when you're worried, when you're excited, the best thing you can do is pray. And so that's what Daniel does. Um, in verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God, and I confessed. He said, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all those who love him and who obey his commands, we've sinned and we've done wrong. We've been wicked and we've rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and your laws. We've not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers and to all the people of the land. And so, here's the way that Daniel opens his prayer. He opens his prayer with a time of confession. He admits to God, hey God, the reason that our homeland has been sacked, uh, the reason that we have been ruined, it's not because you're kind of a capricious God. It's not because you woke up on the wrong side of your throne one morning in heaven, okay? It is because we have sinned. We deserve what we get. Now, this is kind of a stunning thought when you really pause to process it, right? We deserve what we get. Sin and death, all of those things are just what we deserve because we live in a sinful, fallen, broken world and we ourselves are sinners. Which means that all the good stuff that we have, that's not a product of our righteousness, but a product of God's grace. That's kind of the worldview that Daniel has, okay? The bad stuff in life, well, that makes sense because we live in a sinful, fallen, broken world and we ourselves are sinners. The good stuff in life, that doesn't make sense, so it must be a product of God's grace. A, a pastor said it this way once, and it's kind of a very startling and stunning way to say it, but it's true. We deserve hell. Everything else is grace. That's true. That's true. And so that's the worldview that Daniel's operating with. Now, doesn't that make you thankful for the grace of God? Everything in your life that you can say, it is good, right? Your spouse, your kids, your home, all of that is a product of God's grace. 
And God's grace kind of shines through in a huge way in everlasting life. It, it, it's almost like God's grace in our lives, right? It's kind of like a crescendo. We see all of these little tokens of God's grace that glimmer through in our lives, that break through into our homes. And then we get the big shebang at the end with eternal life. We're on a crescendo of grace. It's an amazing thing. And that's really where Daniel lands. In verse 16, in his prayers, I, I love this. He says, O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away from your anger and from your wrath. Daniel operates with a very interesting view of God's righteousness, okay? God's righteousness is ultimately expressed not in judgment, although God has every right to judge because we are sinners, but God's righteousness is ultimately expressed in his grace, in the fact that he turns away from his anger and his wrath, even though he could have anger and wrath forever at us. Okay? God's righteousness, it can result in judgment because he is offended that we have not done what is right, but God's righteousness is expressed in grace through Jesus Christ, who always does everything right. And so the question of God's righteousness is what rightness are you going to trust in? The rightness of yourself? Because if you trust in the rightness of yourself, then all you're going to get is judgment because you're not right. But if you trust in the rightness of God's Son, that's when you get grace because He is always right. That's the gospel message. And so Daniel is praying and he confesses his sin. He leans on the grace of God. And then, in verse 20, he brings to God a, a particular concern that he has. And this is where we left off last time. Okay? Uh, Daniel has a particular concern. Verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. By the way, isn't it kind of interesting that it takes us to get all the way to verse 20 before Daniel finally makes a, a request of God, something that's kind of heavy on his heart and mind. He's too busy confessing his sins, leaning on the grace of God. It's not just, dear God, gimme, 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 gimme. I got a big laundry list of stuff. Rather, I'm going to start with my own sinfulness. I'm going to start with the gospel. And then, now, all the way in verse 20, I have a request. Wouldn't it be kind of interesting if our prayers work like that? Verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. Now, this catapults us back, okay, to Daniel 1 and 2, this whole idea of 70 years. The promise is from the prophet Jeremiah that after 70 years, the Israelites are going to be able to return to their homeland. They're going to be free. They have been sent into exile. They've been in Babylon. They're under the rule and reign of the Persians right now. Now they're going to be able to return home. The holy hill is Jerusalem. The holy hill is where the temple is situated. Read Ezra and Nehemiah. Daniel's concerned already with the holy hill, with Jerusalem with being able to return home, with the temple there. And so, that's on his mind. Now he's going to talk to God about that. And so, while I was still in prayer, verse 21, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. Kind of interesting how Daniel sets this up. Because right now, you know how many sacrifices are going on for the Jews? None. You know why? Because there are, there's not a temple temple's not there. And yet, the temple is so heavy on his heart, his mind, his brain, that even when it comes to the time that Gabriel appears to him, he puts it not, you know, like at the seventh hour of the day, not at 6 p.m. He, he, he times it. He, the first thing that comes to his mind is, oh yeah, we'd usually be doing the evening sacrifice at this time. And so this is very heavy on his heart, very heavy on his mind. Verse 22, he instructed me. And he said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you begin to pray, an answer is given, which I have come to tell you. For you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Now, Daniel is going to uh, receive an interpretation of a vision from the angel Gabriel. Here is the interpretation of the vision. Verse 24, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression and to put an end to sin, 
to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. No one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler will come and will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. Wars will continue until the end. Desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven in the middle of the seven. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of, a te on a wing of the temple... He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Does anybody have any idea what in the world this means? Okay, we're back to numbers. We're back to math. Um, one of the big things that we've been talking about, okay, very important. Let's start here. In apocalyptic literature, Okay, which Daniel is apocalyptic literature. You will remember that apocalyptic literature, uh, the word apocalypsis means an unveiling. Okay, and so we kind of get a glimpse into another plane, another realm, another reality, which is the heavenly reality. That's why the revelation of St. John is sometimes called John's apocalypse. An alternative name for Revelation. Because he has this vision, this glimpse into another reality. Here's Daniel. He's talking to the angel Gabriel. A vision, a glimpse into another reality. Now, one of the things that we've learned about apocalyptic literature, especially when it comes to numbers, is that numbers are strictly literal, right? No. They are highly symbolic. Keep that in mind as we go through these verses. Because that's not going to change here with the 77s, okay? So, verse 24 we start, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, here we get the whole purpose of the 77s. Okay, what is the whole purpose of the 77s? Interestingly enough, the whole purpose of the 77s is not to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Gabriel comes along, Daniel's worried about the temple, and the angel Gabriel says, well, actually, here's what you really need to know. There's going to come a time when transgression's going to be finished, when sin is going to have its end, when wickedness is going to be atoned for, when everlasting righteousness is going to be brought in. That's what you really ought to be gunning for, Daniel. What does that sound like? Or let me put it another way, okay? Um, who finishes transgression? Who puts an end to sin? Who atones for wickedness? Who brings in everlasting righteousness? Sunday school answer is? All right, now, this tells us what this vision is all about. This tells us what the 77s are all about. This vision, these 77s, these numbers, all of this weirdness is all about Jesus. Okay. Now that pretty much tells you what you really need to know about this vision. Everything else is icing. This vision is about Jesus. Now, this becomes infinitely clear in the next verse. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. By the way, that's going to come one year later. I mentioned this earlier in the year 538. So that's the issuing of the decree when Cyrus says, okay, Jews, you can go on home. Okay, you're going to be able to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, um, the Hebrew word here for anointed one is Mashiach. Okay, we get a word that we use often in the Christian church, Messiah, right? So, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Uh, let's go to the book of Ezra here, since this is when the temple is rebuilt. And let's start in Ezra. Ezra 1, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 4. It's Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. 
Ezra 1, beginning at verse 1. It's right after 2 Chronicles. Ezra 1, verses 1 through 4. And so the fulfillment of Daniel 10 verse 25 comes in part in Ezra 1 verses 1 through 4. Cyrus or Darius, his other name, issues a decree that the temple ought to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Now, Daniel also says that the temple is going to be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but also in times of trouble. So flip over to Ezra 3 now. Ezra 3 verses 12 and 13. Okay, this is right after they have rebuilt the foundation of the temple of Jerusalem. Ezra 3, verses 12 and 13. Who wants to read those verses? Okay, here's the idea in Ezra 3, verses 12 and 13. You have these older priests and Levites, and they had seen the former temple, and they had seen the former temple in all of its grandeur and glory. They loved the temple. They remembered the temple. They remembered it before it was destroyed. Now a new temple was being built, and you know what? It's not going to get the Home Builders Award. It's not as good as the old one. These are still times of trouble. And if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you see all sorts of trouble. There's trouble rebuilding the wall. There's trouble from adversaries who do not like the Jews and want to destroy the Jews. There's all sorts of trouble. And it begins with the very foundation of the temple with the Jews themselves, some of whom are not very satisfied with the new building project because they remember how good the old building project was. Out with the new and in with the old. That's their thought. And so, we have the temple in Jerusalem being rebuilt. It's during troubled times, but nevertheless, it gets rebuilt. Now, verse 26, after the 62 sevens, here comes the anointed one, the Mashiach, the anointed one, who is next cut off. What does that mean? He dies. Isaiah 53, verse 8. Who wants to read that? One of the great prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. And there we go. That's what it means to be cut off. It means to be killed. It means to die. Isaiah says the Messiah is going to be cut off from the land of the living. And he's going to have nothing. Uh, does that sound like Jesus on the cross? Here. Does that sound like Jesus on the cross? Yeah. Please. Thank you. Very good. This is important. Yeah. This is all about Jesus. He's going to have nothing. Yeah. Yeah. No descendants. Nothing. And so, you do not need to read the Da Vinci Code and figure out that there's some long-lost relative of Jesus. Okay. The people of the ruler who will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary 
The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. Okay, here's, here's, what, I, here's what I want you to notice next, okay? So the, anoint, the temple is rebuilt. After that, the anointed one comes. And then after that, there are these people of the ruler who come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, here's the question. Who are the people of the ruler? This is very, very interesting. Who is referred to as the ruler in verse 25? From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, who is it? The ruler. Okay, so the ruler is who? The anointed one. In verse 26, now we have his people who come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, that stinks. Why would you have the Messiah's people do so much damage? What's going on? You get the temple rebuilt and then it gets destroyed again? What kind of lousy, messed up, backwards vision is this? By people of the Messiah out of everybody? This doesn't seem very cheery. Daniel's hoping for a rebuilt temple, a glorious temple, a new city that lasts forever. He's hoping to put all of this behind him, and then the angel Gabriel comes along and says, okay, it's going to be rebuilt, and oh yeah, then it's going to be destroyed again. And by the way, it's going to be the Messiah's people that are essentially going to affect that desolation. D does that sound cheery to you? Okay, why is that good news? John 1, verse 14. John 1, verse 14. Who wants to read that? Okay. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right. Um, uh, you may have heard this before. In John 1, 14. Okay, John is talking about the Word who is what? Jesus. And he becomes flesh. And then this little phrase, and he made his dwelling among us. Uh, okay, um, this is a phrase that is drawn from the Old Testament. And it's a phrase that talks about tabernacling. The tabernacle, of course, the predecessor to the temple, the place where God dwelt. And so here's what John is saying. The Word becomes flesh, and he is the temple or the tabernacle among us. Who is the temple or the tabernacle among us? Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is now the place where God dwells. Okay, Paul will often talk about us being temples of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because through faith in Jesus, we are the place where God dwells. Okay, so one of the big messages, one of the big messages of the New Testament is this. You don't need a temple because you're the temple. Jesus is the temple. You don't need the Holy of Holies. You don't need the Ark of the Covenant. You don't need to get it from the Nazis, okay? It's fine. You are the temple. That's one of the big messages of the New Testament. Jesus himself says it. Turn one chapter, John 2. John 2 verse 19. All right, that sounds a little bit weird, and the Jews think it sounds a little bit weird. Verse 20, then, the Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to rebuild this temple. Now, it's not as good as the old one, but it still took us, you know, a few decades to rebuild it, and you're going to raise it again in three days? Now, what does John say in verse 21? But the temple he had spoken of, of was his what? Body. Who's the temple? Jesus is the temple. That's why if you go to Revelation 22, verse 12, go to Revelation 22, verse 12. Who wants to read that? And I, that is not what I'm looking for, actually. Hold on. Let me see if I can find what I'm actually looking for. It may be Revelation 21, verse 12. No? I'm sorry. Let's try this again. Revelation 21, verses, verse 22. Good grief. Revelation 21, verse 22. When we get the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven on the last day when Jesus returns, what is not there? A temple. Well, there is. But what's the temple? Jesus. One of the big themes in the New Testament. 
Okay? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the temple of God. You don't need a temple because you got one. You got Jesus. That's what you need. You need Jesus. This is why, right, we talked about this before. Do you remember Daniel and Daniel 6 and the story of the lion's den? Remember when he prayed what direction he was facing? He was facing toward what? Jerusalem. Because Solomon said, when you pray, pray toward Jerusalem, toward the temple, because that's where God dwells. Do we face toward Jerusalem anymore when we pray? No. But whose name do we pray in? Jesus' name. Because Jesus is the temple. He's the temple. Incredibly important. And so, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and he will have nothing. The temple is going to be destroyed because we got Jesus. Then the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple that he will set up, an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay, here seems to be what's going on then in, in the end of this section, okay? Uh, we have the Mashiach, verse 27, confirming a covenant with many for one seven. Uh, Jesus says the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus dies for many. Okay, in the middle of that seven, an end to sacrifice and offering is going to happen. So Jesus dies, uh, a lot of scholars think, around the year 80, 30. Uh, a few years later, in the year 80, 70, does anybody know what happens to the temple in Jerusalem? Roman general Titus comes marching in and bye-bye. Sacrifices are put, are done. Okay? It's during that time that an abomination that causes desolation, which Jesus talks about, okay, in Matthew 24, he talks about how that's going to happen. But eventually, even that abomination that causes desolation, okay, even all the blood and gore and nastiness is going to come to an end. There comes a time of peace. Jesus is the new temple, and now we're waiting for his return. And so, here's, here's, here's the deal with the 77s, okay? We have the 77s, seven then we have the 62 sevens. And so here's the idea. We have a long time, right? Then we have the Messiah being cut off, followed by this short time. This one seven. And then, the prophecy seems to be fulfilled, and we are waiting for the second coming of Christ. Now, let's do this. I want to take a few of these and pass this around. There you go. There you go. Oh, now let's see. I need one. So, you know, when, when uh, the great biblical commentator Jerome, he's a guy who lived in the 4th century, wrote on Daniel 77s, uh, he, he knew that there were a lot of different uh, debates and interpretations over this. And uh, so he says, I'm going to repeat the view of each, and then um, I'm going to try to leave it up to you to figure out which explanation ought to be followed. Um, I will say this. The last two of these four views are the ones that are the oldest. The first two are much newer. Okay. Um, there are different interpretations of Daniel 77s. The first one is known as the Maccabean view, 
which basically says that this whole thing is fulfilled before Jesus. It is filled with, uh, fulfilled with Judas Maccabeus in the year 164. Um, here, here's the reason that uh, the Maccabean view uh, promotes itself. It promotes itself because it believes that Daniel was written not during the time of Daniel, but uh, several centuries after the time of Daniel. And it was written as prophecy, even though everything that happened in the book of Daniel had already come to pass, because the people who promote this view believe that you cannot foretell the future, even by the Spirit of God. And so that's, that's, where, that's where this view gets its kind of teeth from. They figure, okay, nobody can foretell the future. That means Daniel can't foretell the future. That means that Daniel has to be lying to us and saying that he can foretell the future when he can't really foretell the future. That's kind of a circular argument, don't you think? Because nobody can foretell the future. Daniel can't be foretelling the future. Ergo, Daniel has to be lying to us. And it's not really written by Daniel who lived during the time of the Babylonians and the Persians. It's really written like after the Greeks, and therefore everything has to be fulfilled by the Greeks. And so Daniel 77s cannot possibly be talking about a Messiah who is to come because nobody can foretell the future. Every, everybody, everybody, follow that, everybody follow that view? Oh, some guy who, they don't know. But, but it certainly wasn't Daniel. Couldn't be Daniel. And this could not be about the Messiah. Could not be about Jesus. Because you cannot foretell the future. No, this is this is generally well. It, it, some people who say they are Christians, yes, but this is this is generally. This is. There is a whole stream, okay, of Christian scholars who have an anti-supernaturalistic bent, okay, um, and and really, um, this is it's based on something. Well. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> Here we go. Why not? This is a great question. All right, in the 1880s, okay, a guy named Ernst Trouts wrote a book that really um, kind of affected uh, a lot of scholarly thoughts on the Bible for many years, okay? And he gave us some different principles for interpreting the Bible. And one of those principles is what he called the principle of analogy. Now, the principle of analogy says this, okay? If you cannot find something that is analogous to something that can happen today and something that happened in the Bible, it couldn't have happened in the Bible because it cannot happen today. In other words, here, okay, um, one of the basic principles of science is that if you do an experiment, in order for it to be considered valid, it has to be able to be repeated, right? Okay, that's the principle of analogy. Thank you, Ernst Trouch. Now, he applied that to theology, and he said, we can't part the Red Sea today, ergo, Moses didn't part the Red Sea. People don't rise from the dead today, ergo, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. People can't foretell the future today, ergo, Daniel couldn't have been foretelling the future. That pretty much takes a buzzsaw and chops through all of Christian theology, right? Okay, because, because here's, here's what it does, okay? If you look at the world as kind of a terrarium, okay, and, and you have a lid on the terrarium so that whatever's in the terrarium cannot escape, right? You got a snake in there, a turtle, or whatever, right? Okay, this view says we live in a terrarium and the lid is always on. Always. The Bible says, no, 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 no. There are these times, there are these moments where the lid comes off and everything that's outside comes inside. In fact, in one way, shape, form, or fashion, the lid is always on. Because God, who is outside, is always intersecting with us, who is inside. Ernst Trelch would say, no, stick a lid on it, nothing ever changes. So that's the really... No. 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 This is, this is Ernst Trelch, 1880s, yeah. So it, that's, a, that's a very long answer to your question, but I, I hope that kind of helps. Oh, no, no, uh-uh, I, I like Ernst Strelch. He's fun to talk about. <laughs> At least for me, it doesn't mean I'm any fun for you, but, you know, I, I, it's kind of fun for me. Um, all right, so that's, that's Ernst Strelch, and that's really kind of where this Maccabean view comes from, okay? People can't foretell the future now. That means they wouldn't have been able to foretell the future back then. Uh, by the way, you do know that this whole thing falls apart, right? And, and here's why, okay? How many things happen 
that are perfectly repeatable. Without variation, it's very, very tough. Okay? Using this principle, you not only cut through all of theology like a buzzsaw, you cut through all of history like a buzzsaw. Okay? Try to repeat some of the great moments in history. Okay? Especially those that include dead people. Okay? Are you going to be able to repeat them? Okay. According to Ernst Trelch's principle of analogy, that means they couldn't have happened. Well, that's kind of stupid. Just because you can't repeat it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Okay. That's why when you can look at the Maccabean view and you can go, <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. Was, oh, yes. Um, it, it's called the Maccabean view because it, it um, Judas Maccabeus, you see there in 164, okay? Judas Maccabeus is the one who leads the revolt against Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who is a Greek ruler who sets up a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem and slaughters a pig there. He leads a revolt. He wins the revolt. Everything is fulfilled with Judas Maccabeus. Hence, the reason it's called the Maccabean view. Does that make sense? Well, did, did Ernst, can I write about him? No, no, no. This is Ernst Trelch gave us some basic principles that, that lead to this kind of thinking. That there's no way, there's no way. The, the big deal here is that there's no way that Daniel could foresee the future. So Daniel couldn't have been written by Daniel. It had to be written later. And Daniel couldn't be talking about the Messiah. It had to be fulfilled. Because we know historically that Daniel was written before Jesus. And so we know a couple of things, okay? Uh, because we have copies that are older than, than Jesus, actually. We, we really do. Um, and so we know historically that Daniel was written before Jesus. That much we know. So, number one, Daniel couldn't be writing about Jesus. Number two, Daniel couldn't be foretelling the future. So that leads us to number three. Daniel had to be written after the year 164 BC and not really by Daniel. And Daniel had to be talking about stuff that was already passed as if it was in the future. There you go. View two. Um, dispensational view. You got 70 years of captivity. Um, then you have the decree of Artaxerxes, you see up there, in the year 458. And uh, you have the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, which equals 483 years. Um, here's, here's the deal with this, okay? Uh, the dispensational view uh, takes a week and assumes that it equals a year. Now, I, I would point out something, okay? Um, when Daniel talks in verse 24 about the 77s, all right, um, does he say that they are 70 weeks? No, he simply says that they are 77s. If Daniel wants to talk about a week, he can talk about a week. It's kind of interesting. If you go to Daniel chapter 10, I need to find the verse. Daniel chapter 10, verse 3, okay? I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions until the three weeks were over. Um, here's the way that this works, okay? In, in Hebrew, you will often refer to a week as a seven, because how many days are in a week? Seven days, okay. When Daniel refers to a week, however, he always includes the word days with it. And so, when Daniel talks about the three weeks in Daniel chapter 10, here's the way that it literally reads in Hebrew, okay? It's three seven days. Does that make sense? Okay, so that you know there are seven days in a week, ergo, the NIV will just translate that as week. Okay, here's what's very important. Daniel will talk about the 77s here, but here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't include this word that he always uses when he talks about weeks. He doesn't include days. He just leaves it out there as sevens. What are they? Are they days? Are they months? Are they years? Are they decades? Well, they're probably not any of that stuff. Because as we've talked about, when you just kind of float a number out there and you don't give it a lot of specificity, right, that usually means it's symbolic, like the number 10, the number 7. We, we've seen this before, right? The furnace is heated seven times hotter. Does that mean that literally it was at 100 degrees and it went up to 700 degrees? No, this is a number of fullness. That means that the furnace was as hot as it was going to get. And so the 77s is really more about, oh, 
the fullness of time, kind of like when Paul says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a virgin. Well, what do you know? It gets us back to Jesus. Okay, here's, here's the other reason that it gets very, very tricky, okay, to, to, to interpret these seven weeks and these 62 weeks as years, and you wind up with 483 years. Um, it gets very tricky because of this, okay? Um, if, if, Okay, you start the seven weeks at the decree of Artaxerxes in 458, which, by the way, I tend to start it with the decree of Cyrus in 538 because that's when the decree actually goes out. There are other subsequent degrees. But if you start it with the decree of Artaxerxes in 458, that's going to take you to the year 8025 when the Messiah is cut off. That's too early. Well, some dispensationalists will try to start it in the year 445, Okay, during another decree of Artaxerxes in Nehemiah chapter 2, that takes you to the year A.D. 38. That's too late for the Messiah to be cut off. Any way you cut it, slice it, dice it, if you try to do math with it and turn weeks into years, which I don't even know where you get the years from out of the weeks. In other words, any way that you try to make this literally, any way you try to run a calculator on it, guess what happens? It doesn't work. Why? Because it's not meant to be taken that way. That's, that's the problem with trying to run math on apocalyptic literature. And then people publish books trying to figure this out. And then other people come along and debunk the books trying to figure this out because it's really tricky to do math with apocalyptic literature. Yes? Uh, okay. Um, do we know it? Absolutely for sure. No. Are we very, very close within a couple of years either way? Yes. Yes, okay, generally, okay, um, there are two dates for the birth of Jesus, okay? One is 3 B.C., which means that if Jesus was 33 when he died, that would mean that he died in A.D. 30, okay? Uh, the other one is 1 B.C., which means that when Jesus died, it would be the year A.D. 32. Okay, none of those work with A.D. 25 or A.D. 38, Okay, yeah, there's a little bit of variation there. Yeah, there's some confusion there. Yeah, it's not perfect, but we have it really close. Here's the interesting thing. You know when Jesus probably wasn't born? He probably wasn't born in 81. <laughs> okay? That much we figured out. He was born before himself. That much, okay, we figured out. Basic, basically, what, what happened? And you got to hand it. Uh, 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 when, when the calendar, when we kind of have the calendar that, that, that we have today, uh, there, there was a monk who went through and tried to tally up to try to figure out when Jesus was born. And he got it real close within a couple of years, but he was a little off. That's why Jesus winds up being born before himself. Because he got Jesus being born just, just a little late. But we kept his calendar, and we just adjusted Jesus to come a little bit ahead of time. So, you know, <laughs> Okay, um, so um, my, my, my difficult problem with the dispensational view is this, okay? Um, you try to run literal numbers, okay, and you're trying to figure out when he's going to come. None of the numbers work. Uh, the other problem that I have with the dispensational view, okay, is you notice that after the 483 years, you have a great parenthesis from when the Messiah is cut off, Okay, in the year April 3rd, AD 33, they have him being born in one, which probably isn't true, but that's all right. Uh, it still doesn't work with the math. Um, so you have him being cut off. And then you have from the crucifixion of Jesus, and then the 70th week begins at the end of the year, at the end of the world with something called the Great Tribulation. Um, here's, here's my problem with this, okay? After 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will be have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come, they will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. Desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant for many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put it into sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay, um, so we have the anointed one being cut off, then we have all of this other stuff happening, um, but here's what we do not have. We do not have a great parenthesis of, well, 2,000 years and counting. That just kind of gets inserted. I'm a little concerned about that. The other thing that I'm a little bit concerned of, okay, is in verse 25, 
from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. Okay, who's the ruler? The anointed one. Okay, in the dispensational view of things, the ruler in verse 25 is different from the ruler in verse 26. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will be have nothing. The people of the ruler will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Dispensationalists will say, well, the people of the ruler, uh, the ruler is the antichrist in verse 26. Here's the problem. We know the ruler is the anointed one in verse 25. And so now you're switching rulers without Daniel telling us that you're doing so. Okay, there's one other problem that I have with the dispensational view. The dispensational view um, came up right around eh, 1860. It's a little late. Okay, this, the first two concern me. The last two, it depends. Okay, there are some people who kind of describe the view that I just gave you, which is the preterist view. And I actually do not completely agree with, with this chart. Uh, I would massage it a little bit, but, but basically, basically, it's right. I, I would make a couple of changes to it, okay? This idea that there's a long time, okay, seven sevens and 62 sevens, followed by a short time, the 70th seven, and the 70th seven is all about Jesus and then the temple in Jerusalem gets destroyed. Okay, and I would point out uh, the abomination that causes desolation. Um, that is actually fulfilled when the second temple gets destroyed because that's what Jesus talks about it in terms of in Matthew 24. Okay, now then there's the covenantal view, which is the futurist view, which says that the 70th seven, because this is all symbolic time, the Messiah is cut off and then we're still in the 70th seven that just kind of continues until the end of the world when Jesus comes back. Uh, the last two have been believed by Christians for a long time. Long time. In fact, uh, Luther himself played around with the covenantal view. Um, so these last two views, I'll say, okay, it's a little confusing. The first two views I'm a little bit more reticent about. That's all clear as mud, I'm sure. Okay. Let's circle back around to what's really important about this prophecy. This prophecy is about Jesus. Yes? Yeah. No, these are, these are traditionally, these are where most people fall. They fall, they fall in one of those four. Questions? Yes. Um, yes. Other questions? One other thing, just to kind of wrap this up, Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew 24. I'm going to give you kind of why I like the third rather than the fourth, but Matthew 24, beginning at verse 1, okay? I'm going to read you a couple of things. Here we go. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all of these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Very important, okay? So what is Jesus talking about in Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2? He's talking about a time when the temple is going to be destroyed. When is the temple destroyed? In the year A.D. 70, when Titus comes marching in. Verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? When will what happen? When will the temple be thrown down? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Uh, you will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. By the way, um, somebody actually does come in the year 135 
and does claim to be the Christ, leads the Bar Kokhba revolt, and he is destroyed by the Romans because that's what happens to false messiahs, right? Uh, by the way, Jesus was destroyed by the Romans too. The only problem was he came back. <laughs> so, ah, uh, you can't keep a good messiah down. <laughs> so, okay, none of the other ones did, but he came back. Okay, so uh, here, here's what's so important, okay, about Matthew 24. Jesus sets this up in terms of the temple being destroyed. The disciples are curious about this, okay? Now, go to verse 15. So, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, Jesus talks about the abomination that causes desolation that is spoken of in the prophet Daniel while he's talking to his disciples in Matthew 24 about the temple being destroyed, which happens in AD 70. He says that's when the abomination that causes desolation is going to be there spoken of through the prophet Daniel in the year AD 70. Okay. That's the way that Jesus interprets Daniel. May I just suggest that if that's the way Jesus interprets Daniel, Jesus, I'm going to pull the Jesus card, maybe that ought to be the way that we interpret Daniel. Does this make sense? Okay. That's why this prophecy, let me, let me break it down again, is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He's the one who's cut off. He is the one who, in some weird, awkward, amazing way, the temple gets destroyed. But it's fine, because the temple that really counts doesn't get destroyed. That temple stands. And it's still standing now, because the church is still standing now. Christians are still standing now. And by the way, that's good news. And that's Daniel 77's. You don't have to worry about doing math with it. It's a long time followed by a shorter time. And by the way, the shorter time is the fullness of time. The fullness of time is Jesus. And even in something as scary as an abomination that causes desolation, the end comes for the Roman general Titus. The end comes for the disaster that is in Jerusalem. And you know what we're left with? We're left with Jesus. Not a bad guy to be left with. In two weeks, we'll do Daniel chapter 10. By the way, Daniel chapter 10 is much easier than Daniel chapter 9. Much easier. Much easier. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, and let me, you know what? Let me, while I'm thinking about this. Um, <clears throat> he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Yes, this seems to be, okay, this whole... We do get to the second coming of Jesus, okay, Judy? But that doesn't seem to come, okay? That doesn't seem to come until verse 30. Now, there's... <laughs> this, all gets, this all gets very interesting with different Greek words and different, uh, you know, how, how, how do you work the timeline in Matthew 24? But it seems to be that the first part of this chapter is about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The second part of this chapter, beginning at verse 30, is about the second coming of Christ. I, I can walk you through all the Greek and all the different ways to cut that, slice that, dice that. It's, it seems, well, no, 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 not necessarily, okay? Uh, remember, the end coming... Okay, in verse 12, okay, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands to firm to the end will be saved. That is, that, that is not a moot point at all. We just need to put it in context. And the context is this, okay, just because you have an abomination that causes desolation that is coming, okay, verse, verse 15, all right, just because, this is, this is Matthew 24, okay, yes, yeah, we're back, we're, we're back, we're back to Matthew 24, Okay, well, read Acts 1, right? Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. 
this is, this is kind of interesting. If you, if you begin to pair this with each other and you begin to put it in context, you begin to realize that some of the ways that we pull these out of context isn't necessarily the way that they're always supposed to be interpreted. Okay? And so this seems to be, all right, again, all right, let's go back. All right, verse, verse 3, verse 3. What end are we talking about? Okay, verse 3. Verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the, uh, very important, end of the, not world, end of the age. Okay, now we're dealing with an age, the 70th seven. That gives us context for everything. And, Dan, and Jesus interprets it exactly that way when he talks about the abomination that causes desolation, when he refers back to Daniel. Now, am I going to pretend that everybody agrees with me on that? No. Okay. Um, here is the way that I see kind of my job, okay? Um, eventually, when I'm looking at a Bible passage, I need to ask myself, what is it that best takes into account all of the biblical data that we have. And here's, here's, here's what I mean by that, okay? You get to complicated passages that, like even Jerome, okay, who's a really smart guy, he translated the whole Bible into Latin in the fourth century. Um, even Jerome is going, wow, this is tough, okay? So you look at the different interpretations and you hold them graciously and openly, okay? And the last two, I, 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 I really do because they're, they're old and they're, they've been believed by many Christians of good nature for a long time. And you ask yourself, what best accounts for all of the data that we have in the Bible? And what doesn't? In other words, um, at what times do I begin to go, uh, I call it Bible versus battleship, okay? I, I come to the Bible with a predetermined uh, goal that I, that, that I wanna get to. And I will use my Bible verse to sync anybody else's Bible verse just to make sure that I get what I want out of the text. Okay, I, I, from the bottom of my heart, by the way, I'm fallible, I'm human, doesn't mean I always do this perfectly. I try to ask what best accounts for all of the data, for all of the context in a text. Like for example, reading the beginning of Matthew 24 before I keep on reading through Matthew 24 so that I understand what in the world Jesus is talking about because he gives me the whole context there at the beginning so that when I get to kind of the stranger stuff, I begin to go, okay, remember the context, Zach. Remember the context. And that, that, that kind of reins me in and keeps me on the straight and narrow. Now, again, I'm not saying I do that perfectly. I don't think anyone does it perfectly. Uh, but, um, it is important as much as possible to take into account context and interpretations that best account for all the biblical data that we have. And so, especially this, this, this one verse, okay? Here's usually the way it gets quoted, okay? Well, doesn't it say that everybody has to hear the gospel before Jesus is gonna come again? Okay, that's, that's wrong on two counts. That's wrong on two counts. Number one, no, it doesn't, okay? Number one, it says all nations, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean every single last person on the earth. It means the gospel is going to be preached to the ends of the earth, Acts chapter 1, okay? So we trade nations for individual people, and we wind up with a very weird, oh, well, then Jesus can't be coming because there's still some remote island off in the middle of, okay. Well, no, that's not what it says. That's not what it says, okay? And number two, they forget that the disciples are asking about the end of an age, not the end of the world, okay? And they forget that the commission that the disciples have in Acts chapter 1, we see this go throughout Acts until we essentially get to, guess what? The whole known world, Paul. He's far flung and away, going all over the place. Then all of a sudden, we pull that verse that is used as a pretext and a proof text for something that uh, winds up making people scratch their heads, and all of a sudden it begins to make a lot more sense. Okay, this is, I'll put it this way, okay? This is not a, well, unless you hit that one island over there, I'm not coming back, okay? That's not what that is. It's a promise, though, and by the way, even better, it's a promise that gets fulfilled. The gospel does go forth. It does go forth in an amazingly rapid way. 
I mean, think about it. A small, marginalized Jesus movement that starts with, t with 12 guys winds up spreading throughout the whole earth. How did that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. Jesus promised it. That's how it happened. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Yeah. Could there be a repeat of the situation that they went through with the Romans? Um, you know what? I, I, it could. I'll put it this way. Could it happen? Sure. Um, I am. I am not in the business of being omniscient. Um, and seeing what's going to happen before, before it happens. Um, do I think, all right, that um, that is the point of like Daniel 9 or something? No. Um, do I think that Christian theology very clearly points to where the, te <laughs> where the temple gets relocated? Yes. Okay. You want to look at the temple? Go take a look in the mirror. I mean, really. Well, yeah, Revelation does say Jesus is the temple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know what? They can, they can rebuild the temple all they want to. But um, I, I would encourage, I always encourage, uh, to, to uh, look in the mirror. <laughs> because guess what? It's a lot cheaper if you do. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Well, and, and I, would, I would point you to the book of Hebrews. I would point you to the book of Hebrews, and I would encourage you to remember what the pre preacher of the Hebrews says. Day after day, the priest stands at the temple. He offers these sacrifices. And then this great line, which can never take away sins. Offer them all you want to. But when Jesus offered the one perfect sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. You know why he sat down? Because he doesn't need to stand up anymore because the sacrifices are done. That's it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and the thing is, though, I, I really do think that, yeah, getting to timetables, especially like using the 77s, that can get awfully, as I said, the math, the math never works. Yes. Oh, okay. An abomination of desolation. Here. Okay. Abomination, it's... Uh, nasty, desolation, it destroys. What happens? Abomination that causes desolation. Uh, the Romans are nasty and they destroy. That, I mean, really, it's not, you don't, you don't have to go, oh, well now, is that some coded meeting? No, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's, it's bad and it destroys. The Romans are bad and they destroy. And, and really, you see this all over the book of Daniel, okay? If you go back to Daniel 2 and the statue, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a statue. We have, we have the fourth part of the statue, which is made out of bronze, uh, which, I'm sorry, which is made out of iron mixed with clay. It's, it's, it's the scariest part, okay? If you go to Daniel and his vision of the four beasts, you have the fourth beast, which represents the Roman Empire, just like the bottom of the statue does. And the fourth beast is so ghastly, he can't even compare it to an animal, okay? It's, it's very scary. Romans were scary, scary dudes. Just, just ask Jesus. He had a run-in with him one day. <laughs> scary, scary. And so, really, that's 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 all that it means. It is frightening, ghastly. Okay, just and then, they, they did historically. They destroyed a lot, a lot. They destroyed the Messiah, but he just you know. Uh, no, no. The, the diaspora was, that, that begins at the beginning of uh, the book of Daniel, okay, when the Jews are taken into exile and then they wind up scattered. When they come back, if you ever read Ezra and Nehemiah, you find out that not all the Jews come back. A lot of the Jews stay behind where they, where they have already been, okay, because let's face it, let's say you, you go to a place for 70 years. By that time, you got kids, grandkids, and maybe a couple of great grandkids, right? You're pretty settled in. If you're settled in, if you're doing all right, if you're making good money, yeah, it may be kind of romantic to go back to the place of my ancestors. But some of the Jews were a little bit more practical, okay? And so they're like, man, I'm going to stay where I am. So the, the word diaspora means scattered. 
once the Jews were taken into exile, they remained kind of scattered. Some went back, some didn't, they got spread out, and there you go. Well, okay, what the Romans did in, for those who were in Jerusalem, okay, and then what happened a little bit later in the year 135, okay, um, is that in the year 135, a guy named Hadrian came in, and he desolated Jerusalem too. Uh, the idea was Hadrian was actually going to rebuild Jerusalem, but he decided that he was going to rebuild it as kind of a, a uh, capital of Roman culture. So he was going to set up temples to you know, false gods. Jews didn't like that. Bar Kokhba led a revolt. He destroyed them, and then the Romans came in, and they said, well, we're going to build our city anyway, <laughs> is, is basically what happened. So did they kick them out? Um, no. Did they make it hard for them to live there? Eh, yes. Yes. In fact, you see this even, okay, during the emperor of Jesus' time. The emperor during Jesus' time actually made threats of moving all the Jews out of, out of Jerusalem. That, that was Ti Tiberius Caesar. Okay, this is later than Caesar Augustus. That was, that was Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius Caesar would make threats for, to kick all the Jews out of Jerusalem if they did not comply with him. We actually have letters where he talks about that. That's probably a long answer to that question. Oh, you know what? It could be, to, to be honest, I, I don't, I've never heard the term modern diaspora. I, it may, it, I, I would assume that that simply means that, you know, beginning with Daniel, the Jews were scattered. They were scattered. And so, when the Jews well, yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and again, so yeah. Some Jews that never yes. Uh, well, perhaps there were, no, there were always, well, actually, even during the exiles of Babylon, okay, there were a few peasants, we, we tend to see this in the Bible, who stayed, who stayed behind, yes, yes. It was usually the dignitaries who were exiled out of Babylon, the really important people who could call the new rule, who could cause the new rulers a lot of trouble, okay. But, again, I, 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 I would just point out that in general, um, this leads us into a whole other discussion that involves Romans chapter 9, and we can, we can do that in Romans 11 for that matter. Um, in general, that's of historical curiosity, but it's not necessarily of theological curiosity. It may be historically curious, but theologically, okay, uh, it's, not, it's not as curious. Because remember, okay, Paul in Romans says, who's Israel? All those who believe in Jesus. We can, we can go back to that, and that gets us to a whole, whole new thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your servant, Daniel. And Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we know that even in the midst of abominations that cause desolation, even in the midst of wars and rumors of wars, even in the midst of the trials and the tribulations of this world, um, nothing can keep a good Messiah down. And not only is your son a good Messiah, he's the only one. And so we trust in him, we hope in him, our salvation is in him, so we pray in his name. Amen.